All right. There we go. All right, so welcome everybody that's joining us for this month's Backyard Forestry in 90 minutes. It's still weird for me because it's it's sunny and bright out. Like when we were doing these over the winter, Sharon, it, you know, pitch dark at this point. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's beautiful weather though. Oh really my goodness. Nice. Although look, I'm in a sweater. Like it was freezing <laughs> last night, <laughs> right? Crazy. We, um, Sharon, you know the park, my little park here in town. We uh, mm -hmm. Tuesday night actually planted uh, our pollinator garden. So yeah, sure. you have to come down and see it. It's gorgeous. It's tiny, but um, hopefully effective. <laughs> so what, what, plant, what plants did you uh, put in? So it's all native, yeah. mostly deer resistant, hopefully. And we did actually put just a, um, a 10X fence around it. So you can't really see the fence, but it's there just to protect them, hopefully, from, from the wildlife. So just a Friday, I went down to Sunset Farmstead and uh, Daryl actually um, designed it for me. So we have oh, cool. um, plants that will hopefully have seasonal color, you know, throughout the season. So you have some spring bloomers, some fall, you know, summer so hopefully that's, it'll that's be really important. Yeah, yeah. Got to make it look good all all year, not all year round, but as often as we can. So, but also for pollinators, we have you know species that emerge in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, and you need a food source for them all year. So, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of excited. Hopefully everything survives, and uh, you know we we have a little volunteer watering schedule, and it's all good. So super excited. So let's see, uh, we should probably get started. It's a little after seven. So um, see, people people still pop in, but uh, let's get started to be respectful of people's time. So uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Lori Jensen. I'm the executive director of the New Jersey Forestry Association, and we're super excited to have you again, hopefully, in this case, uh, to Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes online. Uh, so uh, just a real quick little thing about us. Um, we do this every third Thursday of the month, so just put that on your calendar, and uh, hopefully you can join us every every month. Uh, we'll be announcing June's program shortly, so if you get my emails, you'll you'll see what that's all about. Uh, it will be announcing it soon. Uh, and also, just if you're not a member of the uh, Forestry Association, we'd like to ask that you consider becoming a member. Uh, quite a few benefits that we have. We do have newsletters, um, in, in not only print newsletters at the moment, but also some e-newsletters. Uh, you can check out our website. We finally had an in-person annual meeting this year. Super excited to be back in person. Uh, we just opened up registration for the New Jersey Woodland Stewards Program. That had been a little bit on a hiatus with, um, with the COVID pandemic, but we are back in person. So that takes place in September. Uh, information on that is on our website. We'd love to have you join us for that. This is, of course, the Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes program. We represent landowners in all facets of um, uh, woodland by uh, the stewardship uh, taxation committees. We monitor legislation that affects you. Uh, again, if you're not a member, hope, hopefully you'll consider joining. You go right to our website. Um, and if you are a current member and you want to increase your level of support, we won't complain. <laughs> so just wanted to mention that. The other thing is, did you miss some of our past backyard forestries? Well, Good news is we pop them up on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel uh, on your screen. You see the um, uh, the place to go. You could just do a search for the New Jersey Forestry Association, and you can check out some of our YouTube videos right there. Okay, I am very much pleased to introduce our presenter tonight. Uh, Sharon Petzinger comes to us from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Fish and Wildlife, Endangered and Non-Game Species Program. Sharon, it's great to have you here. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen if you'd like to pop up your screen. All right. And I do love your background. <laughs> this is, a, my, the background is High Point State Park. Oh, beautiful. Oh, I should mention too, while you're doing that, for anybody that has questions, we're going to take questions at the end of the webinar. So feel free to pop them in the Q&A uh, at any time, and we will get to them uh, at the end of the webinar. So uh, Q&A, if you want to stop by and say hi, you can stop, do that in the chat, and I'll be monitoring that while uh, Sharon is um, is presenting. Okay, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, so welcome. This is my 
not my first time presenting for Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes, but it's um, been the first time in a long time. I think it's been eight years since, <laughs> um, unless I'm forgetting one or two, but yeah, it's, it's been a while. So thank you for having me back. I really appreciate um, being able to talk about the wildlife and, and the forests and what you can do to enhance your forest for wildlife. And one of the, the reasons we, I do that is because wildlife are very much intertwined with their habitat. Um, whether you have grasslands or forests or wetlands, there are species that are tied to each, each kind of habitat based on um, structure or species, specific plant species, things like that. And so like when we're talking about things like vegetation structure, we're talking about you know, like trees with cavities or with sloth and bark, like a shag bark hickory. Now the Indiana bat, which is hardly endangered, use these trees like, like shag bark hickories to raise their pups. They, they're small enough that they kind of go into these little crevices or under the sloth and bark or in the small cavities and they raise their pups. And they also rely on an open forest canopy um, because they, they really want their roost trees to be warm. You know, they, you have to receive um, sunlight for at least a half a day. So they're looking for a tree that's not surrounded, you know, shaded by other, other trees. And if you create this kind of structure for the Indian of bat, then other species also respond to that, like red-headed woodpeckers, which is state threatened. Um, there are other, you know, pollinators, since we were talking about that a little bit, some moths and butterflies are very much tied to specific plants. And so if you're down in South Jersey, the frosted elephant is a state threatened butterfly and their host plant is the wild indigo. And so they rely on shrubby habitats, but only if wild indigo is growing. So if you maintain this kind of habitat or this, if this habitat exists for the frosted elephant, other species like yellow breasted chats, which is special concern, will also respond to that. And um, butterflies definitely have their specific host species. And so Aragos caper is another one. This is more in the pinelands and they're state endangered and they rely on andropogon grasses or pine barrens reed grass, a savanna kind of habitat. And these kinds of habitats are fire and hydrology dependent. Um, so andropogon like blue stem and broom sedge, they grow very well after a fire and the fire helps maintain that openness. And if you kind of create this savanna type habitat with andropogon grasses, you're likely to get bobwhite down there as well. And so all of these things are kind of intertwined. And so that's why we're trying to promote a lot of vegetation diversity. Um, North and South Jersey have savannas, grasslands, um, pine savannas, oak savannas, uh, shrublands, mature forest lands. All of that is part of what wildlife need to breed and to exist in New Jersey. And birds, that's my specialty in the Endangered Non-Human Species Program, songbirds in particular, birds are indicators of habitat. They're easy to detect. And some of these species are so specialized that if you give me a list of birds on your property, I can tell you what kind of habitat and, and structure that you have. All right, so we have like salt marsh sparrow that are um, obligates for um, high marshes and upland sandpipers for a very large upland uh, grasslands. And then we have some other species that are indicators of shrubby habitats, shrubby habitats in a more open agricultural landscape or shrubby habitats in a more forested landscape. And so all these birds will tell me all these different things. Um, and so we use them as indicators. Now, if you noticed, forgot to mention, all of these birds that I'm showing you are declining, threatened, special concern, um, endangered, and that's because we're in the sixth mass extinction. We're in a biodiversity crisis right now. We have been for, for a bit. And this one is caused by humans and it's accelerating. So just in the last few years, we've been talking about, we've been hearing about um, how many species are faced with extinction, the mammals, the birds, the fish, the reptiles, uh, 400 vertebrate species have become extinct in the last hundred years. New York Times had an insect apocalypse is here, which is why pollinator habitat is so important. And then the 3 billion bird decline, which was um, published in 2019. Now the drivers behind this biodiversity crisis, is kind of multifaceted because we're talking about a global thing. But what you can see um, is in the dark blue here, we're talking about terrestrial. 
And so we're talking about land use change as the biggest driver of decline, followed by direct ex exploitation, which is hunting, in, in a sense, unregulated hunting. Climate change is next, followed by pollution, invasive non-natives, and others. But basically, land use change is the biggest driver of the terrestrial wildlife globally in, in non-marine ec ecosystems. And so talking about the birds in particular, we've had uh, almost 3 billion individual birds disappear, gone, declining of the species since 1970. And the graph on the right will show you kind of what kind of habitats these birds depend on. So grasslands, um, the majority of, of the grassland species are in decline. Boreal forest is next, fellow western, western forest. Um, wetlands are actually increasing, which is a good thing. What we're going to focus on, because we're talking about forests, is the eastern forest and the forest generalists um, bird species as indicators of habitat and structure and, and what they need. Because in, in general, if you have a human caused decline, which is what we're having now, like habitat loss, then we need human produced solutions. And for the birds in particular, habitat loss, you know, whether it be from agricultural intensification for grassland birds, urban sprawl for all habitat types, tropical deforestation for the wintering habitat, these are the largest causes of bird declines by far. We also have other things that, that um, contribute to those declines, like free roaming cats, collisions with buildings and towers, pesticides, and declines of insects. Um, but we're, today we're going to focus mainly on habitat loss and the forests. And so when you're talking about what does forest habitat loss and degradation kind of look like, um, US Fort, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service did a webinar series basically on this and how to kind of bring the birds back from the, or stop the, stop the declines. And so for forest habitat loss, we're looking at converting a forest to development or agriculture. We're looking at loss of habitat through forest succession, which is uh, when you're losing the young forest or the shrublands as it grows up into forest, that's forest succession. And conversion of forest types, such as, um, in the pinelands converting from a pine forest to an oak forest or in a hemlock forest up north converting from a hemlock forest to a, a, a deciduous forest. Forest habitat degradation on the other hand is more about the kind of loss of quality habitat and that can be done through fragmentation so as development in agriculture kind of surrounds a forest and that forest becomes isolated that fragments that forest. And there are some species that need large tracts of, of contiguous forest for them to even consider breeding there. And so fragmentation can um, definitely hinder birds' ability to breed or breed successfully. But there's also loss of vegetation structure and a loss of vegetation diversity that also contribute to the degradation of the habitat. So I'm going to introduce you, birds are indicators, so I'm going to introduce you to three different bird species. The wood thrush, which is the top line, the red line here for the declines, the eastern towhee, which is the middle line, and the prairie warbler, which is the bottom line. So these are bird breeding bird survey trends from 1986 to 2019. So you can see how these populations in New Jersey have declined over the years. Now, these species, these bird species don't have a lot in common. They nest in different places. So the wood thrush, will nest in the shrub layer of a mature forest, and they also eat bugs and berries. The eastern towhee will nest on the ground in a variety of different forest types, and they eat bugs and seeds. The prairie warbler will nest low in a low shrub layer in a more young forest or shrubby habitat, and they eat bugs and caterpillars. They're pretty much insectivorous. They also do not winter in the same place. So the wood thrush will spend its time in southern Mexico and Central America. The eastern towhee will spend its winter in the southern half of the United States. And the prairie warbler will spend its winter in Florida and mostly in the Caribbean. So the only thing these three species have in common is that they breed throughout New Jersey and they need some kind of forest habitat to breed. And so when you're looking at these 
declines in New Jersey and compare it with how mature forests have been um, that trend in New Jersey, you can see forests have basically remained stable while the birds have declined. And so that tells me that the declines don't seem to be correlated with the amount of forest or mature forest that we have in the state. The correlation seems to be more aligned with the amount of young forest that we have in the state. Um, it's actually surprisingly well correlated. Um, and so this, uh, I forgot to mention these graphs, this, this is um, land use land cover from 1986 to 2019, um, kind of superimposed with the, the um, bird trends. And so forest succession, actually, when you're looking at the change of habitat across the, the um, the major forested areas in New Jersey, like the Canutinue Ridge, the Highlands, the Pinelands, you'll find that poor succession now is the greater threat of habitat loss or cause of habitat loss than loss of forest. But there's a lot of people think that, um, you know, all the shrubby habitat occurred after European settlement when people cut down a lot of trees. And so, wildlife populations dependent on that habitat type were kind of artificially elevated than what they would have been before European settlers came. And so we're gonna explore that a little bit. So for this graph, is it shows kind of declines of a lot of different um, species with the decline of forest and the increase of bobolinks and meadowlarks, which are grassland dependent species. And this is for, this is for um, New England. What this doesn't say though is, so it definitely tells you humans had an impact, definitely. But wolves, mountain lions, turkeys, beaver, deer, moose, and bear were all hunted and trapped. And it was all unregulated until the early 1900s. And so you can't really say this decline is solely attributed to the loss of forest because of that unregulated hunting. And then as the forest started to recover, a lot of states like New Jersey reintroduced species like deer and turkey to bring them back. And so it was kind of an assisted um, re return to normal populations or sometimes over elevated populations. And so we're gonna explore a little bit more about what that forest kind of looked like before European settlers came to see if we're you know, if we're getting back to the levels that we should be, or if something needs to change. So a lot of people think, um, you know, you, well, like I, I usually try to visualize, like what did forests look like before European settlers came and kind of did a mass cutting and a mass alteration and, and the farming and things. And a lot of people think this is what it looks like. You have a lot of big trees, it's closed canopy, a lot of um, a lot of things going on. Um, so a lot like the forest of today, except with a lot bigger trees. Well, if you look back into what the early settlers had to say about the forests, um, it actually was not a dense tangle of huge trees with thick underbrush and all of that. It was, um, some people say it was more like park-like with 10 to 30 trees per acre in New Jersey. And, um, some areas with thousands of acres without a train site. And in New Jersey, there was a species called the key pen, which was hunted to extinction that depended on grasslands and shrublands. And it was abundant in New Jersey, uh, actually from Maryland to Massachusetts. So that tells me there was a lot more open kind of grassland and shrubby habitat on the landscape um, before European set, um, settlers came. So how did this habitat get on the landscape? Um, well, records show that New Jersey had stand replacing hurricanes. So these are hurricanes with wind strength similar to an F2 tornado that takes out about 50 to 75% of tree canopy. And these strong hurricanes occurred on average every 85 to 150 years. And so this was one that occurred in Massachusetts in 2011. And so you can see it just topples trees and just knocks out the canopy. You add on top of that, the fires. 
And so New Jersey, depending on where you are, um, if you're in North Jersey, fires occurred every 20 years or less. And these are probably not like the hot fires, um, canopy tree killing fires, like just recently occurred in West Milford. These are probably cooler fire fires that once the canopy opened, it would help keep it open. Whereas down in South Jersey, fires were much more frequent, at least 12 years or less, and usually a little bit hotter and would keep the grasslands and grasslands and shrublands and shrublands and savannas as, as savannas. And um, Long Island used to be a native prairie and pitch pine savanna, just to kind of put that into perspective of how fire played a role um, before European settlers came. And when you go into the paleoecology, which is kind of looking into the history of the ecology of, of the landscapes and the forest um, across the, the, the continent, in Northeast or in New Jersey area, there is a lot of concurrence that we had a warmer and drier climate with recurring fires and droughts. And the charcoal and concentra uh, concentrations in oak pollen agree that we've had, uh, in Northern Jersey at least, oak forests for the last 10,000 years because of this. And our pine barrens have been in pines for about the same um, amount of time. So thousands of years, our forests have been evolving and the wildlife have been evolving with these disturbances. And so if you try to piece together what the forests look like, you kind of have to separate out Northern and Southern New Jersey. They're def different forest types altogether. In Northern New Jersey, um, they estimate, this is uh, from Lorimer and White, less than 7% were old growth. And most likely, knowing the forests of northern New Jersey, most likely they were hemlocks, hemlock ravines, and those protected areas from hurricanes and, uh, and a lot of fires. Um, a lot of the forest was what they call a multi-cohort oak forest, which is kind of like a semi-open canopy oak forest with a lot of shrubs growing um, in all the canopy gaps. So this might be kind of like an old growth oak forest, as, as um, if you could say. And then the rest would be an open or a young forest. And this estimate, it was just for hurricanes. They couldn't predict what, what fires would do with it. And they didn't account for beavers. Beavers, actually, we had at least 10 times more beavers back then than we do today. And they created a lot of this open uh, emergent wetlands and shrubby habitat. And so just based on hurricanes, you know, a hurricane th come through, you'd, you'd get up to the higher level of 50% open canopy young forest. And then that would kind of succeed into more mature forest until the next hurricane comes in. But 10 to 50% is probably the minimum because it's not accounting for fire. Down in South Jersey, they estimated at least 30% of Southern Jersey were in grasslands or scrub variants just from fire alone. And then another 30 to 50% were in uh, kind of a savanna kind of state from high fire and hurricanes. And so we're talking about 60 to 80% at least of Southern Jersey being in an open canopy grassland shrubland kind of state. But what happened? Humans came in, cut the trees, started to do agriculture, build railroads, um, build towns and things like that. And then, um, you know, started building more and more and more. Agriculture became more intense. And then everything else um, that wasn't kept in uh, development or agriculture was left to grow up into forests. And so this is what we have today from the past land use. And as a result, what our forests look like overall 89% of our forests in New Jersey, this is again looking at the major forested areas of Pennantony Ridge, the Highlands and the Pinelands are closed canopy forests, pretty much abandoned in the early 1900s or so and left to grow. And this is, this, at least these are photos in Northern Jersey, this is what it looks like. These are the species that use closed canopy forests most often, the most occurring species. So uh, northern long-eared bats, the wood peewee, great cows of flight catcher and scarlet tanager. These are, the, you would find these in this kind of habitat. The open forest and uh, savanna habitat in Northern Jersey, 
Um, so 7.5% 7 of this habitat occurs in New Jersey right now. Now remember in Northern Jersey, it was 10 to range from 10 to 15 at least. And then in Southern Jersey, it was 30 to 50 of Savannah habitat. So we're definitely under the mark with what used to occur before European settlement. And these are the species that need open canopy forests as their habitat. A lot of declining species, bats, birds, insects. Um, yeah. And then the early successional young forest, um, that's 3.2% of New Jersey's forest right now. Um, and again, 10 to 50% in Northern New Jersey because those two um, young forests and open canopy were combined. In Southern Jersey, we're talking about at least 30%. So we're definitely well below the mark with the early successional and young forest habitat. And these are the birds that depend on that. And there's a lot of overlap between, you, you know, might see some species that were in the open canopy forest that are also in the young forest because they'll use both. But most of our species in New Jersey that are declining rely on this kind of forest disturbance, open canopies, and the shrub layer that grows in adequate sunlight. Now, why is this so important? Well, they evolved with kind of with the variable vegetation. Between the hurricanes and the fires, they had mosaics of different forest types and age classes throughout the forests of New Jersey. And so a species like the golden winged warbler will nest in a young forest habitat. They nest on the ground in the herbaceous layer. And so you need open canopy to grow this. Um, and they forage in the shrub layer, they eat caterpillars. When their chicks leave the nest, this is where they go. A semi-open mature forest provided there's a lot of shrub layer underneath. So they've evolved to kind of take advantage of that mosaic or that patchwork of different forests and um, age classes and structures. On the flip side, the mature forest nesting species that would nest in this kind of habitat, their chicks, when they leave the nest, go to the young forest habitat. And so they too have evolved to kind of take advantage of this mosaic of, of forest age classes and structures. Now, this is also what I'm talking about with the variable vegetation. I'm talking about this on a landscape scale. Um, so not like on five acres, you have little patches. I'm talking about you have 10 acres of the young forest, 10 acres of mature forest, and 10 acres of open forest scattered across thousands of acres of forest, um, not something like within a couple acres of forest. And birds also or wildlife in general, not just birds, but use this kind of habitat as a food source, right? So species, regardless of what the birds eat as adults, whether it's fruits or beetles or spider, spiders or seeds, when they feed their young, they're feeding them mostly caterpillars. And so mo mainly moth caterpillars. Um, and when you look at what moths and butterflies, what their host species are or what, what tree species host the majority of the moths and the butterflies, caterpillars. We're talking about oaks, willows, cherries, birches, and aspens. And if you look at how at what these trees need to grow, their shape, most of them are shade intolerant or intermediate intolerant, which means they need an open canopy to regenerate. And so this is all kind of connected relying on patches of different kinds of forest structures and canopy gaps and shrub layers and herbaceous layers to provide the food that they need to breed to then kind of, well, they need to breed for the population to survive, basically. There are a lot of obstacles to getting this kind of vegetation diversity, right? One is lack of sunlight. Another one are non-native invasive plants. And another one, overabundant deer. So these can all play a role into the habitat degradation part of habitat loss for a lot of these wildlife species. So overabundant deer. You know you have a deer problem when your forest looks like this. When you can fence in an area and you can clearly tell which side the deer are excluded from. If your forest looks more like this, um, this is outside the deer exposure. It looks the same as within the deer exposure. 
then your deer populations are low enough that you don't, that it's not really impeding the structure or the regeneration of the forest. And so here's um, in our areas where we open the canopy, same thing. Deer are excluded. You can tell which, which side the deer are excluded here. Um, a, lot of, a lot of deer browse kind of keeping everything down to the ground, whereas if you exclude them, you start getting hickories and other trees to start growing. Whereas if you don't have that uh, overabundance of deer, you can't tell which side of the fence uh, the deer are excluded from. And if you are thinking that deer have an impact on the habitat structure that causes the declines, um, that's kind of what this graph shows. If deer were having that impact, you would expect to find an inverse relationship, meaning the more deer you have, the more decline you would have of these bird species. And that's not the case. Um, there does not seem to be a correlation with deer population estimates in New Jersey and their decline in New Jersey. Now, generally speaking, if you have 20 deer per square mile or more, it will impede impact the forest and start to impede forest re regeneration and the shrub layer in the forest. The more deer you have per square mile, the greater the impact that will be. Now in 2018, New Jersey averaged about 15 deer per square mile. Now, I know some of you, like I live in Harden County, we have way more than 15 deer per square mile. And that is because deer are in higher densities in kind of residential areas mixed with agricultural areas and patches of forest. The lowest deer populations are in the high density urban areas. And then the second lowest are in the high forested areas without a lot of residential and agriculture um, interspersed in that. And so if you take out kind of some of the high density urban areas, you're probably looking at more like 16 deer per square mile. Um, but in some of the suburban and rural areas where they don't allow hunting, um, you know, it can be over 100 deer per square mile. So the other impact, non-native invasive plants. You know, when you see a forest with a sea of barberry, that's not a good sign. Or another forest that has barberry and mixed with stiltgrass, another sign that um, regeneration is not occurring in that forest and that, that habitat is degraded. Now for birds and wildlife, invasive plants do not supply the best food source. And so yeah, barberry um, supplies some fruit, still grass supplied some seed, but the nutrition levels are lower than the natives, um, than the native fruit bearing plants and seed bearing plants. And also caterpillars do not like to eat barberry. And so if you have if you know they can use the structure for nesting, but that food source, the caterpillars won't be there to feed their chicks. And so that will that will negatively impact it as well. Now the prevalence of invasive plants depends on past land use and also your proximity to kind of residential areas and other areas that might have a lot of invasive plants for them to kind of creep into. Sites that are inundated with non-native plants also indicate that there might be a, a deer problem, overabundant deer, because deer don't like to eat barberry or the non-natives as much as the native plants. And in a lot of areas, if you exclude the deer, then the native vegetation, if given a chance, um, will actually outcompete the invasive non-native plant species. Um, so there is hope with that. So lack of sunlight is what I'll be talking about the rest of this time. So 89% of New Jersey's forests are closed canopy. They're mostly middle-aged with um, middle age for a forest is about 80 to 100 years old, depending on the forest type. And most of them have are closed canopy with more than 80% um, canopy cover. And so there's little vegetation on the shrub and the ground layers. And these are areas that don't have um, a lot of invasive non-native invasive plants and don't have overabundant deer. So the lack of regeneration or lack of the shrub layer is sunlight. And so the example I'm giving you is from Sparta Mountain Wildlife Management Area. 
It's a 3,500-acre forested site open to hunting um, to the public. And so closed canopy forest typically on Sparta Mountain looks like this, around 250 to 550 trees per acre. 10% um, of them are kind of larger trees, more than greater than 13 inch diameter at breast height. Typically the oak hickory, because this, this area has been dominated by oak hickory forest, this is in Northern New Jersey uh, for the last 10,000 years. Um, and the majority of the trees are less or smaller, less than 13 inches DBH, and those are the maple and birches. And so without the fire and the disturbances, our oak forests in the north are converting to a different forest type altogether. Um, so there's over 75% tree cover, um, but a lot of it, you know, some of it is oak, but a lot of it is the maple birch and beech kind of growing in the mid-story layer at this point. The shrubs and the saplings in these sites tend to be maple and birch and witch hazel, which are shade tolerant species. And there's very little, um, usually on average 5% herbaceous cover on the ground floor. Um, and again, Sparta Mountain um, does not have a lot of invasive plants on these, um, in these areas, um, so, but, and not a lot of deer browse. And the bird species that we find in these um, sites before anything is done, we have on average nine bird species, three of them are rare and declining. So when you're addressing sunlight or lack of sunlight, you need to open the canopy to get the shade uh, intolerant and intermediate tolerant vegetation to grow. And so there are two treatments you can do for that. Well, there are more than two treatments, but two treatments we do on Sparta Mountain. We do a seed tree, which retains about 10 to 30% of the canopy trees and a shelter or a shelter wood, which retains about 40 to 50% of the canopy trees. And we mark the trees to be retained um, the desired species, which in this case would be the oak and hickory and some cherry if they're there. And we retain the larger, healthier, more vigorous uh, trees that will drop the seed for, to help with the regeneration of the tree species that we want. We also leave um, wildlife trees. So if there are any trees with cavities, um, shagbark hickories in particular for sloughing bark, um, snags, we try to leave those for wildlife as well when we do any kind of management. So afterwards, um, depending on the treatment, we're left with about 10 to 40 trees per acre. Now 90% of the trees are greater than 13 inches at, um, diameter breast height in oak hickory, because that's what we left. Um, we're at 10 to 40% tree cover um, estimated for this forest type. Um, but over a third of the trees are left on the ground. And we make it messy on purpose. Um, it's great if you have deer problems, it deters deer from, it kind of shelters some of the regeneration. It's also good to bring nutrients back in the soil. And it's also really good for wildlife habitat. But this is also when, you know, it looks its worst because the trees are down, it's a mess, nothing's green. But something amazing happens in the next three to six months. It starts to regenerate on its own. No planting, no seeding. Um, 2,760 live seedlings per acre six months after we do this work. And 85% of them are oak species. Herbaceous cover increases. We're now more than 5%. We have sedges coming in. We have grasses coming in. We have wildflowers coming in. We're still low with invasive non-native plants. And now with, before the end of the first growing season, 15 bird species come in just because of the open canopy and six of them now are rear declining. And this is the same exact site as this one, three to six months later. And this is the same exact site three years later. We're now about 30% tree canopy, um, again, oak hickory, 30% shrub and sapling cover. We have blackberries growing in, which is great for a fruit source. We have oak uh, seedlings coming in, hickories, cherries, the herbaceous cover is now around 30% with um, a lot of different forbs, wildflowers, sedges, and grasslands. Invasive plants are still low, and we're at 24 bird species, 12 are in declining, just three years afterwards. It's really, really amazing. And so if you look at it over the long haul, before management, you average around nine. After management, it kind of goes, it, it just increases. 
um, averaging just under 25 species four years after the management, and then it kind of plateaus. And if you're going to assign, um, just to explain, the orange here, these are the rare and declining species. And then the blue are the all other species that kind of give you the total bird species um, observed during the breeding season before and after management. So if you were going to assign a kind of a conservation score to these bird species based on their state rank or their um, regional or national ranks, and you kind of compare that to the habitat or the habitat structure to see which kind of what structure gives us the best conservation value. It is pretty much open canopy forest a few years after the management is done. This is where you have um, we still have some tree cover, herbaceous cover has increased, shrub cover has increased, and these are, these are the bird uh, conservation scores, the highest up here. The lowest score is before management in the closed canopy forest. And so this tells me how important the diversity of different kind of structures and species of plants are, how valuable they are to our wildlife species in general. And we know how to do this. There's, especially with birds, there's a ton of information about how to manage birds uh, for wildlife. And so this is not an unknown thing. It's not an experiment. It really is something that's been vetted and done for years. Um, and we're losing the battle because conservation, it, this is not happening on a large enough scale to really make an impact. And we're, we definitely need to do a lot more of uh, deer control, invasive control, and opening the canopy for sunlight. And so what we recommend for landowners in general, if you look at you know, a mile or two um, radius around your property, if you have more than 70% forest cover, then you're really good, um, your habitat, your forest is really good for this area sensitive forest bird species. And so that's where you have an opportunity to kind of open the canopy some more and create and enhance the shrub layer in the canopy of uh, the forest that you already have. If you have less than 70% forest cover, um, you can explore either increasing that forest cover to get to that 70% if it's possible. If not, you can still maintain um, open canopy and shrub habitat for birds that are not area sensitive forest species. And before you do any opening of the canopy, what you, you have to control the deer and the invasives first. If you open the canopy without doing that the and don't control it, the invasives will take over, the deer will impede your regeneration. So I can't stress that enough to do that first. Um, and th but this will help allow you to regenerate the shade and tolerant native plant species. Um, you can also plant species that you that are desired if you don't like what's in your forest, um, to kind of transition it to a different forest type if that's what you prefer, and to consider pollinators. And if you're in South Jersey, consider planting um, wild indigo after you open the canopy to, to create habitat for uh, butterflies and things like that. So with that, this is kind of the potpourri of bird species that we get at Sparta Mountain uh, after opening the canopy, this is four years later, and uh, it's really, really amazing what happens when deer are under control, invasives are under control, and light is allowed to penetrate the forest floor. None of this was planted. It's all natural regeneration, all plants kind of waiting to erupt and, and grow after getting that sunlight, and the birds respond. And with that, I'm open to... Uh, questions or anything else? Um, do you want me to stop sharing or should I keep my uh, slide up? Uh, up to you. I guess you can stop sharing if you want, then they get to see us. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not, but <laughs> we'll go with that, right? <laughs> Excellent. Sharon, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I have to tell you, hold on, I'm going to just um, da, 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 just change the view a little bit. Okay, how's that? A little bit better? Uh, okay, so thank you. Uh, I was a little worried there at the beginning. It's kind of like a lot of doom and gloom. I'm like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of getting depressed a little bit, right? But you rallied at the end, some really great advice, some some things that we can actually do. And that is 
uh, really great. I'm so glad you you did that. Um, so there are questions, so I'm going to go through them real quick. But one thing I just want to make sure I mention is, um, and I put this out in an email to our membership uh, a couple days ago, that there's uh, deer fencing grants that are available right now. Um, it's from the Department of Ag, so it is for like agriculture or horticultural use. So you kind of have to be a farmer, but you know, depending on what you sell or what you grow, um, I think you have to have an income uh, previously or income of about ten thousand uh, dollars to qualify. But if anybody has any questions about that, it's first come first serve. So if you qualify, my advice is to get on the application process right away. Um, hopefully, that'll help some people. You know, just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so if you're amenable, we have a couple questions here. So um, Lori, not me, but Lori Klamner wants to know, do yellow <laughs> yellow poplar trees, like tulip trees, do they have helpful caterpillars? Uh, tulip poplars, I believe they're in the um, kind of the aspen family. So yes. 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 Okay. So the answer is yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so um Doug, Doug wanted to know, do any birds eat gypsy moth caterpillars? Boy, wouldn't that be a pleasant thing? Say yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't see birds eating the hairy caterpillars, so to speak, like the gypsy moths or, um, you know, there are some like tussock caterpillars. And I, I think maybe they have a bad, I don't know, they just don't. What I see them eating are, are the smooth green ones, which are from, uh, I think, the genus Arc. Archips, archips. Uh, it's a moth genus, and that's what I see them eating mostly. I I wish they if they ate gypsy moth caterpillars, they probably wouldn't have as much of a problem as you do. For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, good book that uh, at this point you you mentioned a lot about the caterpillars and stuff, and oak being the highest um, generator of of caterpillars for bird species. What uh, Doug Tallamy's Nature's Best Hope. Um, I think we actually had, I uh, had a recording of him that we did for Backyard Forestry a couple of years ago, but if anybody wants a really good book to read, uh, Doug Tallamy, Nature's Best Hope. He has a couple of them. He actually has one, uh, just on oak trees too. So highly recommend any of those. Yeah. The information I provided in my slide was from Tallamy's. So I love yeah. it. <laughs> I love it. It's all good. He's great. Um, Okay, so Peg has a question uh, about the sour lens, right? This is uh, our neck of the woods, right? So um, saying, you know, that the highlands and the pine barrens are, you know, con uh, considered the most forested areas. Um, I don't know where the sour lens fits in that. Um, but of course, as in all of our areas where we are here, it, the, the sour lens have been devastated with um, uh, EAB, you know, the, yeah, I know I can't, I can't, drive anywhere without seeing a ton of dead ash so and beech trees are next beech trees are next yeah exactly so um yeah we we have to figure this out um peg i know we there's really no answer and, and it's um she was just making a point that wasn't really a question there but yeah it's um it's difficult definitely difficult um yeah and in the P in the piedmont region the sourns is definitely the probably the, the best contiguous example of contiguous forest we have in the Piedmont. But when you're looking statewide, like we're, we're looking at like uh, thousands of acres, like tens of thousands of acres as, as the large forest blocks. And so it wasn't my intention to exclude the Sourlands. It just wasn't big enough <laughs> to, yeah. uh, to be in that um, larger scale statewide analysis. Yeah, makes sense. And it is a beautiful area. So oh, yeah. thank you for that thing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, we've got to figure out these dead trees. I know um, I was talking to somebody today about uh, trying to get some funding, even just for municipalities, as it relates to getting rid of the, well, it's not only a human hazard, but a wildfire hazard too, right? There's there's many reasons why they need to go. But um, FSA was also looking at possibly getting some funding to help out. I don't I don't know where that stands right now, but I'll I'll probably find out more next week at the State Board of Ag meeting. So I'll be sure to pass anything along that I hear as, as related as it relates to funding. And and what I would recommend for for properties that have had a lot of ash mortality, because a lot of people ask me, well, what should I plant? Because they want to replace the trees. Mm -hmm. And um and so I I kind of ask them, you know, kind of what kind of area they live in if it's ag more agriculture more forest but if it's in more forest setting i would say don't plant trees or you know don't replace it with um 
another tree per se, but maybe replace it with a shrub or maybe an understory tree that won't be a canopy tree because that's really lacking on the landscape. And that's something if you do plant it, you can fence it in from deer and it can then provide um, kind of a more variety for wildlife in that sense. But if you did want to replace it with a tree, oaks and hickories okay. in North Jersey. <laughs> Although most of the ash are in North Jersey still. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. I didn't think about that with the planting, replanting with a shrub instead. That's awesome. Yeah, so. that's what I've been doing just um, yep. to give birds some nesting cover and some more food. food nice. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, so speaking of uh, beach, Peter said, how do you how do you see the effect of loss of American beach due to beech leaf disease on native animal and plant species? Uh, yeah, not. I mean, beach is definitely a food source. Um, you know, they're you know, little beech nuts and things like that are, you know, a good food source for a lot of wildlife. And so that in the sense will, will be a loss. Um, that said, beech was never really that prevalent on landscape. So it's not like, um, and I don't, I don't know about the insects like moths and caterpillars, how dependent on if there are specific host species for, um, that would be the more detriment would be on, if it's a, like ash is a specific host species for some of the, moths and butterflies. So if ash, if beaches, then yes, that will be an impact. Um, but in general, it wasn't that prevalent on the landscape. And so if we lost some beach, as long as we have other kind of mast bearing or seed fruit bearing um, trees to kind of take that, supply that food source, we should be okay. There you go. And, uh, you know, lo um, uh, Lori was also saying back to, just to the ash trees and stuff. So they they cut down a, a bunch of them and um, have been concerned about replacing their trees. Now she's saying she guesses she should fence the area for deer, then just leave it be. Um, and then she says, oh, that's what you just said. <laughs> so they did plant some uh, arrow viburnum and willow. Yes. Uh, the wet area. So Excellent choices. Yay. Good job, Lori. <laughs> so excellent. Excellent. Um, okay. So, uh, and Terry was just saying, do you advocate installing a deer fence? So I think, um, I think we covered that pretty well. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's landowner dependent. Some, some would prefer to allow people hunting their property before putting up a deer fence because it, it's a lot of maintenance. Yeah, for sure. And expensive, very expensive. And, expensive. and yeah, the maintenance with, with falling trees and stuff. So. But when all else fails, yeah, and there there are some ways, you know, I uh, you can do it, like put up a wire electric fence, so it's not a lot of work and not a lot of maintenance. So there there are some ways you can you can do that without putting in a, a mesh fence or anything like that. There you go. Okay, great. So then, um, um, this is kind of an interesting quandary uh, or or perspective. David was saying. How have wildlife responded to the mass die-off of major tree species? We think chestnut, right? Hemlock, and now, of course, ash. So do we, and again, he's asking, do we know how serious beech leaf disease will be on wildlife habitat? But going back to like the chestnut and the hemlocks, did we see, is there any studies that show any type of detriment to wildlife because of those two species? So chestnut, I wasn't around when the chestnut yeah. like hit in 19... <laughs> Something. Something, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Long, Long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, chestnut wasn't the most abundant tree mm. in, in the New Jersey forest, but they were definitely a part of it. And their nuts were, you know, huge food source, um, particularly for passenger pigeons. Mm. But I don't think the passenger pigeons per se went extinct because of the chestnut blight. I think it was more the hunting that did that. Um, but chestnut trees also got to be really, really, really huge. Like mm. big, massive. Um, and so for nesting structure for hawks and, and things like that, like just yeah, I, I'm sure that really impacted the wildlife, but I, I wish I could say more about how. Um, and I would love to see them come back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we all do, <laughs> definitely. Um, hemlock is happening before our eyes, right? In northern Jersey, we're seeing, and just in the last 20 years or so, we've seen the conversion of a coniferous forest, which would be the hemlock forest, to a mixed forest um, because of the hemlock woolly adelgid and the die-offs. And there are some species that are very much associated with that kind of coniferous forest, that cover, and they're declining as a result, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, 
and we're still thinking about how to, what can we plant that would replace that? And, and we're still trying to figure that out <laughs> because yeah. it, it, you know, hemlock is shade tolerant. It's kind of moisture sensitive. It's very close canopy. It, it creates like this thick shelter for a lot of species. And it's really hard to find something that'll replicate that, mm -hmm. which is a shame. Yeah. Okay. To be determined. Yes. So Deborah wants to know, are tupelos, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, tupelos, a good source for caterpillars and or birds. They grow well in my area. It's T-U-P-E-L-O. Yeah, I think that's black gum, if I remember correctly. Um, Okay. I don't off the top of my head. I don't. I don't remember. But if it's if it's something that's native and has been there for, then I would say yes, definitely, definitely, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're almost done. <laughs> so uh, Kenneth had a good question. Uh, we talked a little bit about a sp invasive species, and holy crow, those pictures that you had of the Barbary in the forest, man. Not good, not good. I don't have to go very far to see that either. I bet, right? <laughs> so uh, Kenneth wants to know, do you think we need more fire to control invasive species? Yes and no. Um, we're, we're starting to experiment more with the role of fire and, and invasive species. And for some, I think there might be a, a benefit. I, I think right now they're trying to figure out barberry. Although Barbary really likes to grow in the wetter areas where fire does not like to burn. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. Um, other species like Elanthus and Mugwort, if you don't kill them at the roots, they're gonna resprout. So fire won't do anything in that sense other than make Elanthus trees thicker. <laughs> Great. And Elanthus is, is the main host tree for uh, spotted lantern fly, oh, which oh. we wanna try to yeah avoid that. Um, yeah, so that is a that is a good question. I'm sure there are some of them are will would be killed by fire, um, but it's just still too new, I think. But I, I would love to try. I would love yeah. to bring fire back to to and figure that out. Yeah, yeah, okay. To be determined, and we'll keep you posted, Kenneth, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so uh, Doug has. Um, uh, so Green Acres owns a 220 acre forest up here in North Jersey. They had a company come in to clear a lot of trees, mostly pines, about 20 years ago. Should Green Acres consider doing this every 20 to 20 to 30 years? Um, he's the steward of the property and don't think that there's a plan in place. So we have to do something about that. Um, so should is that like a good way to, to look at this? Um, clearing every 20 years of or or so um curious as to know what's growing there now that that would be one of my one of my questions and it depends on what your goal is right mm. um so yeah the young the young forest um i would assume this would kind of be more for the young forest because 20 years it kind of ages out into the pole stand the pole stand stage which is like 20 to 40 years or so I mean, that's still beneficial too. That's also cover for wildlife. And so do you wanna exclude that to reset succession with the diversity of birds? And so that that is really a question for the landowner as, as well as how what's regenerating and how well it's regener regenerating. And if it's not regenerating the way you want, definitely reset it or do something to get it in the direction you want it to go. Um, but yeah, on, on Green Acres lands, um, if it's stayed on land, it definitely needs something. <laughs> yeah. And he, uh, he just put in the, the canopy grows quickly with Barberry. Oh, great. Oh, then, yeah, that's, um, in that sense, you probably won't want to reset unless you can get get the invasives under control and, and get the deer under control too, because that might be an issue. Depending yeah. where you are. Okay, some other uh, suggestions or questions. Uh, we're, uh, we're looking to replace the hemlock. Red cedar, that's a question. That is something we've been discussing because structurally that would be very similar, but it is a shade intolerant species. Mm -hmm. okay. And so it's, it's not gonna give that um, the same structure, although that's probably the closest, the best bet we can have for structure-wise for that. So. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> that uh, Peg uh, suggested maybe American Holly as a replacement for Hemlock. What are your thoughts on that? Hmm? Hmm. I think it, I'm trying to rem remember about Holly. I'm not as, the so more Southern species like Holly, I'm not as well versed in how they grow, but I don't think they have, get that kind of thick intertwined canopy that hemlock get, yeah. or that cedars can get if they're growing close together. Right, right. Um, so and that's kind of what we're looking for is, is that, um, and I don't think they would have the same food source as a, as a more coniferous tree as like hemlock or something. Right. Because there are some coniferous dependent species that need that type of tree. Right. Yeah, you're looking at the whole picture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. To that. Yep. <laughs> it's a it's lot hard. to consider, you know. A lot, a lot of states are, I've, I've been asking so many people and people are just, yeah, nobody knows. Nobody's come up with an answer like, oh, this is it. Yeah, yeah. There's no one, one size fits all for sure. Right. You know? So at the moment. Except, hem yeah. except Except hemlock. Okay. Yeah. Keep it from dying. <laughs> yeah. We could do that. Then we're good. We're good to go. Right. Yep. And the beach, of course. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, keep up the good fight. Keep doing the great work. The pictures that you showed, the, you know, from the before, during, and after, um, just amazing. It, it, I literally got goosebumps seeing the progression and how great. And just to see those trees, particularly the oaks, regenerate on their own that's just mm -hmm. magic so and it, it can happen to to anybody um but some for some people we need to do a lot more work yeah. in terms of invasives and deer yeah. but once you get that under control it can you can do it too anybody Fantastic. you know of course can we're do that. excellent we are encouraged and definitely uh going to do our best. So <laughs> thank you again. If anybody else has any other questions, um, you know, please just reach out to me um, and we'll, you know, see if we can get you answers. Uh, you're getting a lot of uh, uh, thank yous and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, really appreciate oh, the time and effort. That I, you... I see in the chat Norway spruce for hemlock. That oh. was discussed too. And that would probably be the best surrogate, but yes, it is not native. So <sighs> There is no one size fits all. There's no one size fits all. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really oh, appreciate this. Yeah. This was great. So thank you, everybody. Um, we will see you next uh next month for our next session. And I hope you all have a great evening. So thanks again. Take care. Bye.